Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for what is a very important uh, event and also a beginning of a process of th trying to think and understand more about what the events of the past week have meant and where uh, we are headed. I'd like to begin um, by asking you all to observe a moment of silence, uh, recognizing the uh, loss of lives, the, the people killed at the scene, the uh, Sean Collins, uh, Collier, the MIT police officer, and all the people that are injured and still uh, trying to recover and whose lives have been changed. So just a moment of silence, please. Um, what I'm going to do, because we have such an extraordinary panel here, uh, what I'm going to do is just give one sentence introductions of each of the people. You've got bios in your, in your program, but you want to hear them, you don't want to hear me. Uh, they are each exceptional and it's a terrific combination of folks. Let me start with uh, Commissioner Ed Davis, uh, a very familiar figure to all of you who have been watching this whole thing. Uh, he is the Boston Police Commissioner, has been that since 2006. Prior to that, he had more than 25 years uh, on the Lowell uh, Police Force. Uh, next, we have Juliet Kayyem. Uh, she is a uh, professor here at the Kennedy School, but she's also been, uh, she's a national foreign policy co uh, columnist. You would have seen her on CNN and other shows. She was, in re until recently, the Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs at Homeland Security. This was a case, by the way, of lots of that going on. Uh, she was also the uh, Homeland Security Advisor to Deval Patrick. Um, next to her, I have uh, Kurt Schwartz. He is the Director of the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency uh, and the Undersecretary for Homeland Security uh, here in Massachusetts, again, deeply involved. Next, we have uh, Dean David Hempton. He is the Dean of the Divinity School uh, and a, a, a new, relatively new Dean at the Divinity School. but. Uh, he spent much of his life growing up in uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland and witnessing what it means to be in an environment where these things are more commonplace. Um, uh, finally, on my left, we have David Wade. He is a uh, anchor and, and a morning news anchor and, and reporter for WBZ TV. He was at the scene in Watertown, as many people here noticed, and he got many kudos from places like Columbia School of Journalism and so forth for his coverage and, and so on. So let me um, begin, but let me start by asking for one thing. All of these people were deeply involved in keeping us safe, in keeping us informed, keeping us involved, especially the people that put their lives on the line. I'd like to ask you to give them a very great hand for everything. <laughs> So my first question is a really simple one. It's in, it is basically a how did you pull this off question. Uh, it was terrible, horrible events uh, uh, transfixed us all. But when I think about the fact that we have the Boston police, we have the state police, we have this terrible murder uh, at MIT, we have the MIT police that come down right by here, we have the Harvard police involved, we have the Cambridge police, somebody's calling 911 about a carjacking, then it's in Watertown and we've got the MBTA or the transit police involved. I haven't even started talking about the FBI and the, the various federal agencies and so forth. President's got to be informed. We've got all the, we've got the governor, we've got the mayor and so forth. Um, in 9-11, they didn't have anything like this kind of communication challenge and, and there was, a, there was a, a great deal of discussion. Somehow or other, you created a team that managed to set up a perimeter that figured out how you do searches. I just want to know how that worked, and is it all this planning or the lessons? How did it all happen? Let me start with you, Commissioner. Well, thank you, Dean, and uh, uh, good evening to everybody. Um, I think the simple answer to that question is that the investments that have been made in preparedness uh, since 9-11 paid off for us. We, um, we all knew each other, first of all. We, we, we all are uh, uh, people who work together and train together and see each other on a very regular basis. All of, all of the principles in this. Um, the other thing was uh, the training that we do uh, to prepare for 
these, these type of incidents, something called Urban Shield, uh, some other training that's come out of DHS that has all different labels on it, uh, have, have, have forced us, have forced us to think about this, to think about the unthinkable. And when you do that, when you, when you envision uh, what might happen and how you might react to it, um, you, you respond in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that's uh, probably more thoughtful than, than if not. And then f for me, um, some of the international experience that I've had in dealing with people who have uh, managed these things uh, makes it uh, less daunting, uh, makes, it, makes you believe that um, if, if Ian Blair was able to deal with it after 2005 in the, uh, in the tube bombings in London, uh, then there's a process, and we're going to follow that process and get through it. And when you were making decisions about, you know, questions about lockdown or um, the nature of the searches and so forth, uh, was that a, uh, was there a team of people that would get together? Did you, how do you involve the, the political, um, uh, the officials, all that kind of thing? How did that all work? Well, on the, on the uh, lockdown decision, um, that was a, a very interesting conversation. It occurred in the uh, back of the command post of the transit uh, police. They, they had their CP on scene first. And it's a very small place. There, there were five or six of us sort of jammed into what amounts to a, uh, a house trailer. And uh, we had uh, the governor on the phone and the mayor on the phone. And um, Kurt was there and, and uh, uh, put, put the calls through to the governor. I got the calls through, through to the mayor. And uh, everybody went around and, and, and gave a situational report on what they knew and where we were. And uh, so the, the colonel from the state police, the head of the Transit Authority Police, uh, myself, uh, FBI, ATF, we all reported to the governor. We all reported to the mayor. Then there was a conversation between all the principals. And um, at the end of that conversation, we determined that, that there was a course of action we needed to follow. Kurt, you were there also. How did how did this all fit together? And, and is it really the, the training really worked? Uh, a couple couple quick comments to follow on Ed. Um, it, it's all about training. It's all about investments. Um, it was all about teamwork. Um, we were, if I almost hate to say, we we were fortunate. This occurred, but it occurred during an event um, that. Uh, there was a large uh, coordinated public safety effort already stood up for. Um, all of the agencies and resources were staged. Uh, we, we spend months preparing for the marathon. We did a tabletop exercise the week before, which included a, a bombing scenario in it. Uh, we had a multi-agency coordination center already running. Um, so we we put a lot of time, effort, energy, and thought into these events. Um, on top of that, as Ed said, you know, within uh, minutes of these bombings, um, you know, the, a command level group was standing in the street and we were working together uh, to, to start sorting through a lot of these issues. Um, and I, I want to just, <laughs> one other comment in terms of the decision to do this shelter in place. One of the success stories here, I believe, is, is the way that public safety and political leaders, public safety leaders and political leaders were able to work together. Um, so the mayor and the governor, um, I was a principal, the governor's principal person uh, on scene from Monday through Friday. Ed was clearly the mayor's principal person um, we were able to work together. The mayor and the governor were able to work together. We, we made a number of very difficult decisions during the week. There were times in which there were some disagreement around the table, uh, but at the end we always reached a consensus decision uh, and we executed. Um, and it would have been on the public safety side a significant impact on us if we had not had the relationship with the political leaders that I think, think we did. So to some degree, it was also an advantage. You had a lot of people that had been on the scene a long time, gotten to know each other, worked well together, and so on. Let me turn to the press briefly. Um, and Juliet, you can also comment on this past part, since you were obviously quite involved in the intergovernmental stuff before. 
Um, I guess I'd just start by asking you, um, Mr. Wade, uh, what, the, uh, what it was like when you got there and how you got your information when you're sort of standing and, and yeah, how do you cover it? And in a minute, I want to go to social media. Well, it was, so Thursday night going into Friday, I, I worked the morning show, which means uh, I was dead asleep at midnight trying to catch just a little bit of sleep before going in back early again. And my executive producer called and said, there's this chase in Watertown. Uh, there's a shootout. There's explosions. Uh, two suspects throwing things out the window that are exploding. And we need you to go right there, which didn't seem like a smart idea to me. But, <laughs> but your wife, left. My wife, who, by the way, is in the back with our three-week-old baby. If you, hear any, if you hear a baby crying and you wonder who brings a baby to something like this, I haven't been home, so. It's a cheap way to get applause, I know. <laughs> so I, I just started driving into Watertown and driving in on Arsenal Street, passing all these federal vehicles, ATF, FBI, I'm thinking, okay, at some point they're going to stop me because that's sort of the status quo for crime scenes. Just kept driving, just kept going and going and going. Next thing you know, uh, the live truck is there, the, rep the photographer is there, hands me the microphone and I'm on live on television. You talk about getting information, uh, really, in that situation, the objective is threefold. Get the best information you can. Get the facts. Number two, try to paint a picture of what it's like to be in that neighborhood at that time for the viewer. And maybe for some of the people who live near there who may be in their homes and may be afraid. And then number three, get out of the way. Don't get in the way of what they're trying to do. What they're trying to do, obviously, in a situation like that is far more important than what I'm trying to do. So don't get in the way of what they're doing. Don't give away their tactical information, but give the people at home a sense of what's happening. And just from talking to some of the police officers who were running by with rifles and heavily armed vehicles, uh, behind the scenes sort of asking, what can you tell me? Is the second suspect out there? Are there explosives on this particular street? Start to parse together some information that you can pass along to the viewer. And I think I never have any shame in saying what I don't know. There's no problem with going on TV saying, here's what I don't know, here's the information that I'm trying to get. It's far better than embellishing and pretending like you know more than you do. Yeah, I want to actually ask you about that, Juliet, um, because you obviously were in a different position in the sense that you weren't on the scene, per se, but you were very nearby. Um, but of course, there was lots of commentary throughout the week, um, and some of it was very grand in its speculation, others was more circumspect, yours was much more circumspect. How do you think about that, and how do you weigh it? Because uh, people love to hear, well, is it foreign, yeah, is it domestic, and how did, you, how did you handle that? Is this on? Yeah. So uh, thank you for asking that question, because I have two roles. Um, uh, one is the Globe, which first, you know, there's some Globe reporters in here. If you ever want proof of why you need strong local newspapers, it was the last 10 days. I mean, what that paper did and the website to educate people, that's the point, not the, you know, tell them what's going on. And um, so I looked at it two different ways. One, the columns was, uh, which I produced four over the course of the 10-day of the period, and I'll have a sort of close out one tomorrow talking about next steps, was to try to give some perspective to just a lot of activity that is very unfamiliar for people who aren't in public safety. I mean, that's what I began to realize, is that this world that we work in, that we think is very transparent, is you know, people don't know what an incident command is. They don't know what you know, various decisions are being made. So you know, basic information is really helpful. And I think I had the ability to take 15 years of experience in this field. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to write was to just sort of shine a light on a very important aspect of um, people's security. So I, I used the globe that way. CNN was very different because you had just this, I had never experienced anything like that before where um, they, were very, they wanted very much to utilize the fact that I knew all the key players and knew the city um, as well as the expertise from the federal side. And I think um, it was hard because there is a lot of speculation on TV, but I think what I just constantly tell myself is, you know, what would my mom want to know right now if she were sitting in her house and this were happening in her city? So explain to people, for example, on air. So uh, a bunch of your police officers were standing right when, right when the lockdown happened. 
about 200, about 200 feet from uh, where I was with Anderson Cooper, and this was the morning of, and you know, it looks like they're being idle, right? You know, oh God, they're just standing around there and we're all scared. Sort of explaining what was going on, that they were pre-positioning to be driven somewhere to you know, get into the, that's helpful because uh, people don't know what that looks like. Um, you know, and then finally, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, for those of us who are on the outside, you know, uh, seeing how really unique and remarkable it was. I know we're going to say that a lot tonight, but I'm sure there was a lot of disagreement or some disagreement. I know how these things work, but that what Kurt was saying about you didn't get a sense that anyone was just looking out for themselves. And I think to portray that also was very important, that there's no conspiracy here. It's just trying to get this thing done, and within seven days it was. So There was lots of talk about social media throughout this period. And of course, um, there was some obvious things. People knew things instantly. They may not be true, but they knew things. Uh, and of course, uh, it, it set forth this grand sleuthing, uh, crowdsourcing the so forth. I'm, I'm just interested from all of you that were involved, uh, how did that affect things? First, in terms of getting the word out and, and uh, you know, uh, we're used to sort of, okay, let's get the information straight, let's get it out, we don't want to confuse folks. I mean, even, even that's 10 minutes, you, you want it, but 10 minutes is an eternity. How did, how did that affect, and was there any surprise there, or had you anticipated that, and um, what was your, how did that all work for you? Well, from our perspective, the, the first important issue there was <clears throat> that we had already established a presence on Twitter and Facebook and other social media sites. So people followed us. We were in the, uh, in the business of having a back and forth with people that wasn't just uh, one-way communications as press releases are. And, um, and so we have people on staff that know how to do that. And, um, and so the primary reason we used it, and I, I just went back over the tweets today over that... Uh, five-day period, uh, was to correct information. Uh, there was a lot of bad information that was going out. And when it came uh, to our attention, we started to put out the information that we knew. Now, th there's a difference between the information that we knew and the truth. <laughs> okay, so, the, so the, 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 the fog of war applies to situations like this. And sometimes the best information that you have at a particular time changes 30 minutes later. Uh, we tried very hard to, uh, to, be, um, uh, to hold back until we were fairly certain of the information, and then we would correct it. And, and I think that was helpful. That was the biggest thing. But we used it in a different way during the pursuit that, that I've never done before, and I, 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 was, uh, I was very happy we had the opportunity to do that. Uh, at one point, um, early in the morning, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, at the command post, I was with uh, Tim Alban and, uh, and Kurt and um, uh, Rick Delorier, and um, we got very good photographs of the two suspects um, sent over our telephones uh, to, to the commanders from the scene of uh, the Gulf Station in, uh, in Alston. And um, we had seen pictures before of them, and I had been intimately involved in reviewing the videotape over and over again. But these were the first clear face shots that we had of the two individuals. And the other benefit of those photos was that they, uh, they showed the way they were dressed that evening. So we made a decision to get those out to all of our officers and beyond quickly. Ten years from now, that would have required driving a photograph back into headquarters, reproducing it, uh, and, and physically carrying it out to the individuals and trying to give it to news stations so they could get it out. I was able in three mouse clicks to to broadcast that to uh, the, the, the police department um, and, and all of the followers that I had on my personal account. And then the police department was able to put it out instantaneously uh, to a wide swath of people who were monitoring this. So we had uh, really good information out there very quickly. So it was sort of a strategic uh, being sort of knocking down rumors and a tactical value, the, the, the uh, the photos of the suspects being put out to people uh, in, in the pursuit. The downside, were there downsides to having so many people engaged and involved? We obviously saw the misidentification of there's some lives that are probably pretty badly serious, badly damaged by all that. What about the downside of all this, the such rapidity? And again, you want to correct the rumors, but you, want, you don't know if they're right or wrong for a while. You got to go, you know, how, how did that? Right. You, you can't just put out that we're looking for uh, a man with a white hat and have media outlets publishing people randomly wearing white hats. Uh, 
that, that's not logical and it's not something that we expected. And, and I think it's irresponsible on the part of the people who did it. So uh, it, it, it's clearly a downside. The comment I, that, that I'll make, I'll just broaden this out from uh, just use of social media to the extent of the media coverage, um, the 24-7, uh, nonstop, all channels all across the world. And, um, you know, as we all did, we heard from people all over the world. My daughter called me from Berlin saying, I'm watching Dad. My son called from St. Louis. Um, and the executive director of the National Ambulance Service in Israel called me Monday at 4 o'clock within an hour to say we're prepared to put a team on a plane. Now that's because they were all watching and I had a relationship. But, um, you know, I wonder, and I don't have an answer to this, I wonder, you know, um, in these types of events, I mean, this was a new experience for me. Um, you know, what this does, if anything, to the decision-making process uh, that we operated under. I will tell you that I was largely oblivious for much of this time to the extent of the coverage other than the number of reporters um, that were out there. But, um, you know, we, we, were, we were chasing, uh, as I said, you know, the, the information that we acted on was changing quite a bit. I mean, uh, on Monday afternoon, noon it was, and um, were there two explosions? Were there three? Were there seven unexploded bombs? You know, the, we JFK um, Library, um, the JFK Library. What was it? Uh, and then again on Friday, um, did we have one person at large? Was there a cell of people? Were they in Boston? Were they not in Boston? Um, and we're trying to make decisions while the whole world is watching. I think we did a good job. I don't think it infected our process, uh, but it is something to think about going forward. David, how did you feel like the press, I mean, how did the social media affect you? And in general, how would you rate how you all did? As a uh, first, with the, with the social media, I, I think we're hearing from the commissioner and uh, un under Secretary Schwartz about how the information uh, sort of came into them, and we see similar things on television where, uh, you know, the old days of someone calling the operator to get the phone number to WBZ, then talking to the assignment manager, and then talking to someone in the newsroom who is then going to forward the information to the producer. That's gone. I have people talking to me directly while I'm on the air. And I love Twitter, by the way. I'm constantly uh, live tweeting during the show information that we always know to be true, not just random things. But I think that's one part of it, is the information that comes in. But I think it's also very important, the information that gets out with Twitter. The fact that uh, the undersecretary decides that he's going to shut down a lockdown, stay-at-home order, whatever the phrase may be, uh, Watertown and Newton and Alston Brighton and Waltham. And that information, for me to get out, I can reach the person sitting in their living room through their television set, but I can't really reach that person who's sitting in the Starbucks ordering a coffee. I can through Twitter. Next thing you know, it goes from Kurt Schwartz to us to me, to that guy in the Starbucks. And I think that's a very powerful tool. I think it can be powerful the other way as well, in that there was a lot of scanner traffic, which you don't report scanner traffic. And yet I saw a lot of people on Twitter who were passing along information that, yeah, some of it was accurate, but it's not supposed to be out there yet. And a lot of it was way off base and shouldn't have been out there. So I think that there were disappointing parts of what was reported, and I put it the air quotes, on Twitter. And then I think there were a lot of good things that came out of it. How would you rate the, how the media performed? It depends on which media. I mean, obviously, there were two uh, big blips for the media. One was Wednesday's uh, announcement of a capture, and then the next was a misidentification. Um, and those happen. I mean, you know, and there's going to be a story about how that happened. I'm actually not privy to either one. Uh, I think, so it depends on which medium. Uh, I found, uh, I really do think, I'm going to say this again, that, that for people who live in a community that this is happening to, local matters a lot. It matters that you know where Alston is. I mean, really. I mean, how hard is that to figure out? But, um, and so, and, and I think people are familiar with your face, familiar with uh, uh, Boston Globe uh, writers and journalists, and they're familiar with, with the community. So I think, uh, to me, 
in the same way that this felt like a very local attack, and it actually turns out that they were here, that they were actually Bostonians. I mean, whatever name you want to put on them, we're going to have to figure this out. They are from here. Um, uh, I really thought that the local side of it was really impressive. I think on the 24-7, and I mean, I know the network I was working for during that, that period, people are interested. There are a lot of people know people in Boston. I was surprised how interested people were. Uh, I don't know if it's the remnants of 9-11, which maybe I got over, and maybe just people are anxious. And uh, to hear people who know something who can explain it, that feedback, I thought, at least if I could provide that. And maybe because I've been in the field, I sort of thought, oh, you know, everyone, you know, we all knew this could happen, right? How surprised could we be? But the truth is people are very nervous. I want to talk to, uh, turn to you, Dean Hampton. Uh, Dean Hampton. Uh, you, you grew up in Northern Ireland. You spent your life uh, in a place where these kinds of things were, if not commonplace, altogether too common. Uh, how does that, how did that affect uh, the human toll? Um, is this, uh, you know, ultimately does life go on? And, and here in Boston, of course, this was such a major event. And, you know, some people think out of proportion for, but it, it, it all of us, I think, feel intensely. Um, tell me how that, that affects it and your perspective mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, commonplace is not far wrong. Um, and I sent out a message to our students, just I was reminded myself that in, in one Friday in 1972, there were 22 bombs in Belfast in 75 minutes. Um, and that was obviously unusual, but uh, just looking at some of the websites, uh, said there were uh, 10,000 bombs associated with the Northern Ireland Troubles in 30 years. So it was a, a pretty extensive um, uh, campaign. Having said that, there was something, I mean, obviously when this event happened and I was in my office and you know, people said, you know, something's happened at the Boston Marathon, come and see, and the, you know, the, the pictures were already uh, on screen. Um, that it did f affect me, I think, in a very particular way for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is that it was just such a, a good-natured com community folk culture event, um, um, and it was unusual for anything like that to be attacked in, 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 in uh, Belfast. The other thing that was striking was that it was, there it was live on television. You, you actually saw the puff of smoke, you heard the bang, you heard the screaming people, you saw the bloodied bodies, you know. Uh, so um, that was very uncommon in, in, in uh, Northern Ireland that, you know, these bombings were often, um, you know, surprise bombs as this one was, but was no media coverage, the media would arrive you know, much later, and you, you saw pictures after the event. So there was something striking about just seeing it happen that was um, um, uh, bringing back the 9-11 memories in a way that you're actually witnessing this, and there's something quite um, specially moving and disturbing about that. Um, um, the other thing that I found, uh, you know, very moving about the events in, in Boston that was really different in, in, in Belfast is that uh, Belfast was a very divided society, so bombings were contested territory. Um, you know, uh, uh, IRA, Republican bombing, you know, uh, brought forth uh, desire for revenge from loyalist, unionist bombings. So, um, so the degree of unanimity here of, um, you know, of uh, coming together as a city uh, was, um, I think, especially moving to me given the, the Belfast background where all of this was bitterly contested the whole time. And then uh, on my way over to be here, you know, the long march from the Divinity School to the Kennedy School um, <clears throat> across the campus, you know, that new plaza space in Harvard just outside the Science Center on the way into the yard. Are these, um, um, large billboards about 50 feet long, double-sided, where people are writing messages, you know, and there's literally uh, hundreds and hundreds of these messages, and many of the messages are the same, you know, be strong Boston, or, 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 or thank you to the police, or, or compassion for the victims and those who suffered, and just to feel that sense of community togetherness 
it's a wonderful thing and, and I've even found, you know, in the uh, comments made by um, you know, our students or religious leaders and so on, there's been a, a real degree of, of, um, of togetherness and facing up to this, which is a very different experience from the one I had. Last question, then I'm going to go to the audience for questions, and you can line up the microphones. Um, uh, it really is a basic question, is this the new face of terror, and what face is it that we just saw? Uh, you know, on one level, this has a certain feel, uh, as you said, they're Bostonians, they've lived here a long time, uh, just two guys who mostly don't seem, so far, people don't seem to think they're very connected with an outside organization, probably found this stuff, uh, you can find it on the internet, whether that's how they found it, we don't know. That feels more like some of the domestic stuff we were used to seeing, the kind of, uh, at least one of them seem, uh, you know, pretty disconnected and having real problems and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, we have the clear connection to Chechnya and to the international side and so forth. And I guess what's terrifying to a lot of us is, you know, if, and in fact, it feels a little more like the, some of the, the British bombings that we've seen. Um, but is, you know, I understand how you use intelligence and so forth for large organizations. It's a lot harder if there's two guys who can do it in their backyard. Um, so I guess really my question is, how do, you, how, do you, how do we think about this going forward? Is this the kind of thing that we're going to see more and more of? Is this just, is this another, you know, a horrible Newtown-like event, but just with a slightly different face? How, how do we think about this? I, I would value your thoughts. From my perspective, I, I think it's certainly prudent to be uh, aware and to uh, and to be cautious in in uh, anything that we do. Um, we don't want to frighten people. We don't want to give in to uh, terrorists who want us to change our way of life. And I think you see here in Boston that the out the outcome of this uh, of this heinous crime uh, is a stronger city and, and, and people who have showed her heroism and courage and. Uh, have pulled together. So maybe uh, the people who think about doing these things will understand that they have not been successful and rethink it. But it, this hasn't played out yet, and I don't know how it's going to play out, but our fear of a lone wolf who is uh, uh, getting instruction from Inspire magazine and, and going out and doing uh, things that they advocate uh, is very difficult to in, in intercept um, the, the uh, the detection has to be done at the point, and it has to be done in partnership with the community. There are not enough police officers in the United States to secure every event that occurs. We need to keep our eyes open and work very closely together, police and citizens alike. Julia? So I, I don't, I'll let, like Commissioner Davis, I don't want to underestimate what a big deal this was. It was. I mean, it is the, it is actually the, thing that people in the field had often wondered, why isn't this happening more often, just given the radicalization that was going on on the internet. And that it happened here is obviously very uh, personally distressing. But I don't want to over-credit them. This was not an existential threat. This was not, this was horrible um, and uh, worthy of the resources and condemnation that it receives. But. Um, it's a good news, bad news story, is that to the extent that this looks more like whack-a-mole, like how do we figure out who these people are, how do we get communities engaged so that if there seems to be radicalization, uh, law enforcement is notified, how do we do these things better is important. And, and on the other side, if we expect that this is the face of it, what can we do as societies you know, to prepare for it? I talk and teach on resiliency. And how does that, what does that look like for a city like ours? How do we restore where we were or the new normal? And so I, so I do think some really important moves were made. I think the Obama administration's almost immediate slap down of this enemy combatant thing was not only legally right, I think it was uh, the most important thing to do. We're not gonna begin to get back into those debates. And I think Ken Feinberg putting it into a normal claims process, all these normalization things will help us I don't want to say we're going to, it's going to be normal, but will help us absorb these shocks a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Sure. Under Secretary Schwartz, do you want to? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. A couple of quick things. Um, you know, what's the new? Is there a new face? Uh, you know, I, um, I said Monday afternoon to a few people, um, uh, this is a game changer, 
but I don't yet know how it changes the game. All I know is that we're uh, thinking differently today than uh, now. Somebody, uh, the Secretary of Public Safety yesterday as we sat waiting for the funeral of Sean Collier to start, turned to me and said, can I ask you a question? Were you surprised on Monday afternoon? And you know, it was an interesting question. And I turned to her and I said, you know, if you'd asked me a week ago, a week before the marathon, could this happen? I would have said, it absolutely could have happened. And I'll echo what Juliet said. We've been wondering why this hasn't happened. So I would have said, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened somewhere, sometime. We planned for it. But I will tell you, Monday afternoon, what was the thing that hit me the most? It was not the horrible scene that I saw, um, which was just beyond words, but it was the realization that came pretty quickly that this was a terrorist strike. Uh, that's what hit me the hardest, because it was the game changer. Um, so I don't know what the new face is. Um, I guess my last comment is I said on Monday night to somebody, um, my hope, as I was thinking just at that moment, was that this was not going to be, um, and I said the worst thing this will be is for the city and for the state is that this is international terrorism. Uh, I, said, I hope that it's just a lone wolf, a nut, a domestic something. Um, now that I'm a week out of it and starting to think about the future, I'm sort of thinking the other because we've, lear we, we, we've done a pretty good job learning how to attack and defend against that international thing. But a week later, as I'm thinking about it, I'm saying, you know, probably the worst thing for us as a law enforcement public safety community is that these were two locals, and Vice President Biden described them better today than any of us could, um, because we have to figure out how to, how to work against that. All right, I'm going to open it up for questions, and you can raise questions to anybody here or whatever else. Obviously, there may be some things that uh, people can't talk about. But we have four microphones placed here. There's one right here, one up at here, another one here, and yet another one here. So let me just explain what a good question at the Kennedy School consists of. Uh, first, you identify yourself. Uh, second, you ask a, a single, uh, thoughtful, short um, uh, question. And third, a question ends with a question mark. Um, so with that, let me start right up here. And I'm just going to rotate around here. Yes. Hi, um, my name's Miriam. I'm a senior at the college. I wanted to ask about the scanner, the, the, radi the police radios. Um, Thursday night, myself and a lot of people I know stayed up well into the night listening to these scanners. And it was, I experienced the event in a way I'd never experienced it before because it was almost like you were there live. And I wanted to ask about whether you were, um, whether, everyone was aware that people were listening to these and how that changes um, trying to ensure public safety um, and also journalism during, during such an event. We are aware that, uh, that people uh, monitor those radios. And um, a lot of times in, in uh, routine communications, especially when there's a, a homicide investigation or some serious incident that occurs, uh, we tend to shy away from the radio and, uh, and use other means of communication. So, it, so, you know, things that are important and critical don't, don't get out into the media. Um, but in, in, a, uh, in a situation that unfolded Thursday night to Friday, uh, where there was a running gun battle and uh, people were uh, uh, needing to communicate, uh, those lines tend to be wide open, and you're hearing exactly what's happening as it's happening. Right here. Hi, my name is John Murad. I'm a mid-career student here. Uh, this question is for the Commissioner and, and the Undersecretary. In the wake of 9-11, the NYPD elbowed its way into a, uh, a national and even international position in order to take measures to secure its own safety, perhaps parallel to or even separate from the federal government. Is that something that you envision for Boston after this incident? I, um, I've had several conversations with the mayor. Uh, we're at the very beginning. Uh, of understanding what happened and why it happened and what we can do to better uh, deal with it. Um, we're going to look at everything. Uh, however, there's been no indication that that, that 
type of investment would have been helpful to this situation. It may play out differently, but at this point in time, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're examining all options. I don't see that one on the table. Mr. Secretary, you may. Uh, I, I don't really have anything to add to that other than to say that um, we do have a very effective partnership, uh, local, state, and federal, uh, and the terrorism world it centers around the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Um, I think all of us will be looking to see what we can do better, where we can improve, but we came into this and we start from a very strong point. Um, I, I don't know this firsthand, but I've certainly heard anecdotally that the relationships and the partnerships we have here in this region through our JTTF are, are, are something, are a model uh, for others around the country to look at the way we work and cooperate here. So uh, perhaps we can improve, but we start in a pretty good spot. Right over here. My name is Patricia Garcia Rios. I work here at the Kennedy School as a video producer. And uh, my question is not meant for anybody in particular, but it's about the, the video, the images from the uh, various cameras that were released and the timing of it. I was actually in Europe most of last week, and I think it was Thursday or maybe even Friday, the uh, image on one of the newspapers, the front page was that image of the eight-year-old boy with his mother and his sister and the bomber and the bomb behind it. And I, I had a huge reaction to it. I was very upset that that image was released. Um, and I, I wonder what went on in terms of gathering those images, releasing them to the press. So I guess both the behind the scenes in terms of law enforcement and how those images were uh, gathered or, you know, and then on the part of the media, what decisions were made in terms of releasing them or not. Thank you. Uh, we, we only released uh, one or two in, um, images. Okay, there we go. That we felt were the best images uh, that would help us identify, uh, help people identify the individuals. Uh, the, the one particular photo that you are referring to, I've seen. I don't believe that we that the, that came out of official uh, uh, sources. The problem was that once we released the photo of the actual suspects, then everybody went to their cameras and checked, and people who saw or happened to pick one of these guys up started to tweet those, those pictures out. So in this day and age, it's hard to, um, it's hard to uh, stop it. How'd you handle that? Well, the sheer volume of photos on that day was striking just because of how many, and I think the commissioner alluded to this uh, in the middle of last week, it's one of the most photographed spots, right? I mean, you're four hours and nine minutes into the marathon, you have your loved ones crossing, and everyone has a camera out. Everyone's taking pictures. And so this idea that, that law enforcement is, is giving us photos, not normally how it works. Uh, what they give us are the photos that help in their investigation in which we pass along. But we had many photos coming in from viewers. We had many photos. We were the official station of the Boston Marathon, so we had a huge uh, contingent of photographers that were on the finish line when this actually happened. And like anything else, you, you look at the photos and, you, and, and you, you question the value of them. Is this something that helps to tell this story? Is this something that is beneficial to the viewer? Is this something that does nothing but uh, bring heartache to people? So with each picture that makes it on television, you have this sort of thought process this vetting process before it goes on TV. And you have the same with the video that we captured at the finish line of the explosions. At some point you say, okay, I think we've, showed, uh, we've shown those, those explosions enough. Okay, people have seen them. They know that there were explosions. Uh, but early on, you make the decision that it's probably important to show it so that people can see exactly what happened. Uh, maybe it's helpful in the investigation as well. And, but there's always an ongoing conversation in a newsroom, and the same I'm sure at the Boston Globe, of course, uh, to decide what's worth putting out there for people. Hi, I'm Leora Falk. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School, and I'm from Newton, Massachusetts, right along the marathon route. And first, I just want to say thank you so much, and this week really made me proud to be a Bostonian. Um, my question is about consuming the media. You guys all spoke very in, analytically about 
how the media was produced and what came out. And my question is, what can be done, what steps can be taken to get the public to consume both traditional media and social media skeptically and carefully during an emergency? I, um, I think experience dictates that. Um, you know, there's a commercial on television about everything on the media is, uh, you have to believe it because it's all true. Uh, that's naive at best, and, and I think it, it applies to everything. You, you, I think that people who go on Twitter and, and, and go on Facebook and, and use it here and there uh, quickly understand that um, some things need to be taken with, with a grain of salt. Um, and and it, we're new. This is all new. It's all within the last 10 years. So uh, there's a learning curve, but I, but I think time will, 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 uh, will take care of that. Can I add, Don? Um, I sort of, in watching you and others, I sort of felt like a really important part of your job is actually trying to s get people to slow down or no, we really don't know that. No, just because it was a, you know, a, a, a bomb in a, inside of a pressure cooker doesn't prove that it was an Al-Qaeda event or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, do I, you became, I became more direct about as I got more and more tired after 21 hours of, uh, um, yeah, I think that's a really important role. I have to be honest with you. I uh, struggled with, you know, you know, struggled with, uh, how fast things were happening, how to process them, but then realized that uh, caution was actually totally appropriate and people actually appreciate it. That they want the information, but they understand that the pieces are going to unfold in ways that are, uh, we have no idea right now. So if I was, you know, people said the C was for me for caution NN, right? So I would be on saying, okay, we actually don't know this yet, we don't know that, we, here's what you can surmise from this or here's why the, the lockdown or shutdown or you know what we're going to call um, is is significant. I mean you can't deny that it was significant. So but you have to put it in perspective, and I think that's important because I do think um, uh, uh, that there is a role for that, and hopefully it, it was helpful for people to be able to hear sort of how it works. People want to know how it works. How, how did these people all come together? Figure out the decision-making process, and at least through um, analogy, uh, I could do that. I think it's going to be a little bit harder now with the investigation, because there is this tendency to think about intelligence failures at, at this stage. And I mean, all, all I keep saying is, you know, let's get to the intelligence before we get to the failure. I mean, you are going to see a lot of uh, not credible, uh, what do you say, cover your back, I guess is the nice way to say it. Uh, uh, things being said, you're going to see inconsistencies, even the family members. I mean, to be honest, I don't, tr I mean, anytime one of the family members speaks now, it's, you got to take it with a grain of salt. I hope you all know that. So, not the family members of the, of the suspect. Um, so, you know, this might, it might get a little bit harder, but that was, that was my goal for staying on for 20 hours, because it was a big deal. I mean, it, there's no denying it. In terms of the media, and I've, I've sort of asked myself this many times, I asked myself uh, this early on in the event, uh, the way we approached uh, the media in terms of speaking directly to the media was um, as there, you know, it was every number of hours when uh, we thought it was either time to go back out or there was a particular reason to go out, a group came out and spoke to the media. Um, uh, as I look back on, I, I wonder whether we could have uh, done better in working with the media and had a, a, a spokesperson that came out more frequently, that came out every hour, um, even if there wasn't something new to say, to reiterate, um, uh, yes, we're still asking people to stay inside and here's why we're asking. Um, so I, I think we need to look at uh, now, on the other side, um, uh, you know, when you face a, such a large number, I mean, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, um, the few times that it was opened up for questions, um, it was not a very pretty dynamic. Um, it seemed to me, from where I'm standing, that the questions that, we were, that were being shouted the loudest were not necessarily uh, people trying to get at the most important information to get out, uh, but uh, 
trying to find that I gotcha or that shocking piece or a headline, something. Um, so what that did for us is to say, you know, we're just not going to take questions um, because it's not a productive scenario. And you know, that was, so uh, I think we have to look. I mean, I would like to say that I hope I never have to go through an experience like this again. Um, but uh, we need to take on our end, I think, uh, a close look at how we could have done better um, uh, in communicating. Um, uh, you know, the, I think the tweets become the easy way for us to do it, but we're limited to the 140 characters, and uh, it hits a wa huge audience. Um, you know, when, when Boston TPD does a tweet, um, that gets picked up by NEMA, and we retweet it. Um, and then, uh, you know, the Celtics were retweeting um, some of our stuff. And, you know, I think by the time it was done, we were hitting millions and millions and millions of people, even though any one of our agencies may only have hundreds of thousands of followers. So, uh, David, do you feel pressure? Did you get pressure to, again, you said you wanted to be very careful about what the facts are and where not. But you certainly get the sense that there's a lot of pressure to say the more dramatic thing, to say, gee, it looks like they're about to go in right now, or they've surrounded this house, or, you know, did you see this door broken down? I mean, do you feel the pressure of competition or other media, or did you find actually in this one it was better to be straight? I, it's funny, I think, I think on a daily basis, covering stories, there's that competition of, you know, hey, it would be great if we get the interview and the other station didn't. I'm sure it's the same with the newspapers. I, I'd love to get this and I hope they don't. To me, once you hit a story of this magnitude, all of that goes out the window. Uh, ratings are the furthest thing from my mind in a situation like this. Uh, beating the competition, furthest thing from my mind. It's getting the information right and doing the best you can with limited information. One of the, uh, the different things that I heard from people on Twitter, you know, you keep saying the same thing. Right? You're on forever and you're not, you don't really have any new information. To which I would say, okay, um, there are nine towns in lockdown. We could go back to let's make a deal. I mean, what are our choices at that point? It's a public safety situation. And so you do the best with the information that's being given to you officially. You do the best with the information that you have from sources on the ground. And one point that I want to make is that a lot of the criticism at least I feel, over the past week or two has been from uh, some of the network reporters who came in, and not to besmirch their reputation, but they come in, they don't know the area, and at the end of the day, they're going back to somewhere else. At the end of the day, I'm from Channel 4. I'm from Somerville. I'm from Tewksbury. I'm going to see these police officers in the street. A lot of them know my friends, right? So I have to live with the reputation of the things that I say on television. And because of that, I think local news is still very, very uh, careful about sullying um, that relationship with the viewer. I have to watch every word because I'm going to live with it tomorrow with the viewer. So say, well, let's hope local newspapers and news don't go the way of the dinosaurs or whatever, yeah. Hi, my name is Amelia San Miguel, and I'm a freshman at the college. And, um, Throughout this event, we've seen the, the perpetrator widely described as a domestic terrorist, right? While gun violence in the past has not been described so. So I'm wondering, is there a fundamental difference? And if so, what is it? And why is there this distinction? Just before I came over, I dealt with that question just before I came here. Um, it was, it was asked by one of the media outlets. Um, there, there is no question that we have had serious homicides in the city. Wilson Street had four homicide victims, and four people were killed in this attack. Um, and so people are asking the question, what's the difference? When um, homicide happens in inner city neighborhoods, uh, it's almost invisible sometimes. You know, it, uh, it happens, and people don't ask a lot of questions about it, and I don't think that's fair. And we, we trouble with that all the time. We're constantly discussing it. Um, in this particular case, though, this was a widely publicized incident that happened on videotape. People saw it. It happened at, a, at an event that's uh, never had trouble before. It's a joyous, uh, long-term, 116, 117 years of 
uh, of relatively uh, non-problematic, uh, uh, you know, execution of the of the race. And then um, the other thing is, people come here from all over the world to race to, to, to be in that race, and so there was an automatic international audience for this, and um, people felt I could have been there. A, l a lot of people that I talked to said I go up that street all the time. Or when I went to college in Boston, I used to go there, or you know, this place or that place. So it became a very personal experience to people, and I think that drove a lot of the uh, the interest on it. Uh, but it's, it's still a fundamental, you know, unfairness about this to have all these young kids that are killed every every year, and uh, there are very few of us that are at those scenes all the time and talk to the families and, and understand the the carnage that is wrought through uh, through uh, illegal guns that are out there on the street. So. Uh, I live it, and, and I understand people's upset about it. David um, Hampton, I mean, uh, I don't actually, I don't want to ask this. I mean, in Northern Ireland, this kind of thing, as you said, became commonplace. It became normal. Uh, people may think about that the same way we somehow think about traffic deaths or gun deaths or whatever. Does that change the dynamic of uh, just how people feel, and it's just okay? Uh, you don't think about it, you don't worry about it, you don't take precautions, or do you do, I mean, I'm just trying to understand where you leave. Because again, this, the, this, we do have dramatic events that kill more people than this every day in various ways, and yet we don't give it this kind of energy emotionally or, or in, in the media. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things I would say that um, the worst bombing incidents in Northern Ireland, like this one, were no warning public space bombs, which are designed to hurt and kill, and those are terrible. Um, both the paramilitary, the main paramilitary organizations on each side, um, twigged reasonably early on that those were propaganda disasters for their causes. So there was a move towards warning bombs. Sometimes the warnings were too late for the police to evacuate and people were hurt. And, um, um, so, and some, you know, that, the very last big bomb in, in Northern Ireland, the Oma bombing in 1998, just after the peace agreement was signed when there were, I think, 29 people killed. And uh, the warnings, if they came, were just too late um, uh, 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 for that. But so, so one thing is that uh, uh, even in Northern Ireland, this kind of uh, new warning public space bomb became reasonably un, uh, unusual. Um, um, the other thing I'd say is that because the amount of bombing in, in Belfast, it, it became uh, almost an iron cage city. I mean, uh, there was a cage around the city that you had to... Uh, uh, enter, um, you had to be searched to get into the city anywhere. There was no access without searching. You were then searched again at every department store just in case you were missed first time round. Um, so, um, and there were, you know, there, were, there was a mil military presence on the streets um, as well. So, um, uh, and of course everything began to change, you know, legal processes, you know, trial systems. Um, uh, uh, and you know, for the citizens of the city, you began to plot and plan your life about what was wise to do and not what was not wise to do. I mean, when uh, you know, my wife was in the audience when we were uh, uh, dating, uh, you know, we stayed well away from the city at night at weekends. You know, you just never knew if there would be a bomb in a bar or a restaurant or or whatever that you would be caught up in something. But so the scale of this was 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 quite. Um, What's kind of interesting, uh, you know, what I think is a question that is really uh, important to think about here is to what extent is this a game changer in any way? Because there, um, some commonality, uh, commonalities I see are that young disaffected males um, with um, um, not well integrated into social systems or, or into employment systems um, uh, on the move, who can be radicalized by ideologies, re religious or political, or, or both uh, often. Um, um, these are dangerous uh, young men, and there is an international side to this, to go back to the question. You know, we see it in this, you know, as this investigation proceeds, we'll learn more and more uh, about that. 
So when you think of the world order, um, what was um, very special in Boston is really pretty prevalent throughout our world. I mean, you look at the number of bombings in Iraq in a given week or, 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 or whatever it might happen to be. So, um, or even the number of cities that have been touched, you know, London, Madrid, and, and, and so on. Um, um, so the direct answer to your question is you pay a price for these things in terms of, you know, you, a steely resilient resolve emerges, but life isn't normal. Uh, you know, adjustments have to be made. I, I don't think that that is the scenario I envisage for Boston. I really don't. I, I think I would be surprised if that turned out to be. I very much hope that is not the case because it's a, you know, all kinds of life just changes. But the same kind of steely resilience that we've seen in Boston emerges, no matter how often these things happen. Medical professionals, first responders, police, people doing professional jobs. There's a great rallying cry, or a rallying around humane professional values that keep society moving along, uh, uh, however bad these <laughs> things get. Right up here. Hi, my name is Will, and I'm a member of the Forum Committee, and I'm going to actually ask a question that we got over Twitter, which is, in retrospect, was the citywide shutdown necessary? Well, I, I will say with a great deal of confidence and strength that it was the right decision at that time. Um, at 4.30 in the morning, um, you, we, we knew that the people now that we were looking for or the person were the bombers from Monday. We knew what they had done on Monday. We uh, knew that they had executed ambush, uh, executed a police officer. We knew they uh, were on the move with bombs and they'd exploded bombs uh, during a car chase. Uh, we knew that there was one person on the loose. We did not know whether there were, uh, whether this was just two brothers and that was it, but we had to, we, we had in the interest of public safety to believe and to think and to consider the possibility that there were others and there was information that was developing which turned out not to be accurate information, but we were acting on information that suggested to us that in fact uh, there was a good chance we were chasing more than one person. Um, so uh, we, we started the discussion, well, maybe we can just shut down the bus service through Watertown and perhaps uh, the Red Line station here in Harvard Square and leave everything else open. It was 4.30 in the morning. Everybody was going to be headed to the city and another the commute was about to start. Uh, we consulted with the transit system who said, if you want to do a sort of managed partial shutdown, it's going to take us an hour or two to work out a plan, and it became easy. We don't have an hour or two. Um, this was not, a, my final point, this was not a case, you know, we've all dealt with threats against, you know, areas or the city where, you know, there's a piece of intelligence that suggests that maybe there's a threat. Um, we weren't dealing with a threat. We were dealing with terrorists in our midst that had killed in horrendous ways. So. I'm not, I stand here today saying we made the right decision. It was a reasonable decision. Was it unprecedented? Yes. Was it bold? Yes. Um, we knew we couldn't, we weren't going to leave that in place uh, into the nighttime. We knew that all along and that if we didn't get our guy, we were going to have to back down from that. But uh, it was the right decision at the time on what we knew. Just briefly to add to that. Um, not only do I agree with everything that Kurt said, that it was a no-brainer, that uh, it made a lot of sense, but when you think about it, every year, sometimes three times, sometimes four times, when little white snowflakes begin to fall on our head, we shut the city down. This was at least as serious as that, if not more. Right up here. Hi, uh, Jim Tull, uh, class of 1997 from here, mid-career. And I want to ask a question about lessons learned for political leaders, so maybe primarily for Dean Elwood and Professor Kayyem, but not exclusively, of course. I asked the same question of uh, Professor Heifetz 11 years ago up in the Malkin penthouse uh, when we were doing a similar but smaller forum post 9-11. 
The question is, what should political leaders learn from this and in terms of how they think about these sort of crises going forward? And specifically, Commissioner Davis mentioned that we want to be more aware without becoming afraid. The concern, of course, is if they don't get it right, political leadership doesn't get it right on the federal, state, or local level, then it leans us more toward fear. And uh, certainly we're going to hear, um, I suspect, a lot of debates on the federal, state, and local level about what they should have done or could do going forward. So I'd just love to hear what you can tell students at the Kennedy School about that. I'll start. So I do think political leadership matters in a crisis. And uh, maybe because I worked for many of them, um, I thought that calm, uh, confident, competent tone that was clearly you know, emanating from public safety teams that knew what was going on and also did not know what was going on was unbelievably helpful for this this uh, city, but also, I think, for the nation. Th there is another way that narrative could have been told, and I know people like the question about the shutdown, was that too much? I mean, you know, it, and Kurt's exactly right. I mean, it's, you know, at the moment, it was the app, it was, it was a no-brainer. Um, but, uh, there was another way this could have been presented, and we forget that way, right? That could have been, you know, uh, much more uh, wild speculation coming from leadership, much more um, suspicions. Your, your, your knockdown of the Saudi rumor was huge. That day one, remember, that was a victim. That was not the, the suspect. So I think, that, I think there is a lot to learn about that sort of uh, uh, competency, which is clear. But on the lessons learned side, so, However painful it would be, we need to revisit this before Kurt and the commissioner, before the undersecretary and the commissioner forget everything, because they're going to finally get a good night's sleep. And so I, you know, whether it's um, an independent review of someone not tied to Massachusetts and Boston, which is what I'm urging for, I mean, I think it, to, to grasp what it was that they were going through and to educate every other public safety entity in the world. I mean, every city has a major sporting event. Every city brings people together. Every, that's why we love cities. And so there's so much to learn here. Uh, a lot good, some better, right? You might want to do it better. Um, and so I hope that that process, which I'm sure has already begun internally, um, also is a way to, uh, to get an objective view of sort of, okay, now that we're stepping away from this, how can we learn? And then, you know, I'm big into the lessons learned process. It's how you relive it and redo it and get better next time. I, I would just add just two things that I was struck by uh, this time, which was there was a huge effort to speak with one voice. You, you didn't have the mayor saying one thing and the mayor of Watertown saying something else. And, you know, it was one voice. It was a calm voice, and it was a voice that was slow to anger, which I think is also just as important. You're angry, you're upset, you're emotional. Um, and it happened on your watch, so it feels very personal. And the fact that you don't quickly point fingers, you say, let's figure out what's going on, let's resolve this, and then we will take appropriate action. I think that is unbelievably important. And the fact that there were no discordant, very few discordant voices that were sort of saying, no, we have to fight back this, or we've got to do this, or if it's this, this is what we're going to do. I think that that's, I think, a lesson I hope was learned from the past. Yeah. Just, um, you know, moving from the short term to the longer term political leadership, I mean, um, I think one of the things that um, went wrong in, in, um, uh, in Northern Ireland was that um, uh, a degree of, of political overreaction um, in, uh, for example, uh, in, I think it was 1971, um, the political leadership decided to bring in internment without trial for um, uh, terrorist suspects. And the thing is that their intelligence wasn't very good and lots of people were rounded up. It was quite sectarian at the start as well. So you know, almost 2,000 people interned without Trial, which then just became a, a real sore in the community, which, which made things worse. So that I think um, some kind of measured, thoughtful, mature, reflective leadership, uh, not just in the instant of it, but going forward and having confidence in you know, proper processes and so on really becomes very important. Otherwise, a bad situation becomes a whole lot worse. Great, this is going to have to be the last question. 
I did. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Jamie Bergstein. I work in the admissions department here at the Kennedy School. Um, this is for Commissioner Davis. Um, it's not a question. I just. I just wanted to thank you. Um, it's a great team. Really great. I tried not to cry, um, but yes, I ran. I was forced to stop at mile 24. Um, Monday was probably the scariest day of my life, but just the support from the Boston Police Department and all the other police departments and the first responders were amazing and I think gave me hope and gave everyone hope. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. think of a better note to end on, um, but let me add one last point, which is I also spent a lot of time talking with our students here. We have students from 90 different countries here at the Kennedy School alone. Um, and one of the most interesting remarks was a not uncommon one from many countries. It said, I can't believe how much you trust your police officers. It said, when they said these are the guys, you thought those were the guys. When they told you to stop running, you stopped running. When they told you to stay in your houses, you stayed in your house. And when they said it was over, you thought it was over. Said that is the most precious resource in our country. You would, the last people you go to is the police because you're vulnerable. That's when they can exploit you. So I'd like to end with, again, a big hand for all those people who kept us safe throughout this country. <laughs>